uh, today uh, I will be talking uh, about our uh, testbed studies at Walsh University. Uh, I will be, into, uh, the work you're doing here is together with Professor Alem Raputsane and uh, Birkan Yilmaz. Uh, so the outline of the talk uh, will be, I will first be talking about the mock circulatory network uh, testbed we are developing at uh, Bolsh University. And uh, the next one will be the macro scale water channel testbed. Uh, so uh, first of all, what's the incentive uh, for uh, working on two separate net, uh, testbeds? Uh, which are actually quite different, uh, but still they're both related to molecular communications. So uh, we've been pursuing uh, theoretical uh, work and also simulations on molecular communications for uh, uh, over 13 years by now. And it is actually time to start some uh, real experimentation. Actually, we're not the only uh, group that's uh, doing real experimentation. Uh, as we have uh, just uh, seen, uh, there are other groups, and we will also see uh, after uh, my presentation, uh, we have other groups also who are now uh, working on uh, experimentation. So uh, this is, I believe, uh, the way to go for all researchers, uh, while, of course, uh, keeping our uh, work on uh, theoretical uh, work and also uh, going with the simulations because it's much easier and faster compared to real physical experimentation. But I believe we should also start as the uh, molecular communication society, we should also start putting uh, bits and pieces together towards a more holistic manner. So the first test bed I'm going to talk about is a step in that direction. It's not, of course, uh, the full final thing, but it's a step in that direction for integrating uh, what we have been doing in our uh, lab, uh, but also uh, hopefully in the future to be able to integrate with the uh, outcome and the test beds of the other research groups. Uh, so we'd like to also share our experience here uh, with the other groups. Uh, we also would like to enable new applications, not be only restricted with applications in the human body, which is quite important, and we're also focusing on that. But we should also be able to enable uh, new applications. So the second uh, test bed is somewhat towards that direction. So let me uh, first talk about uh, the uh, mock circulatory network test bed we are developing. Uh, so the aim is actually in this test bed, the aim is to the ultimate aim is to actually uh, have a circulatory network which uh, mocks the circulatory system in the human body so that we can actually integrate uh, small test systems uh, on a circulatory system so that, for example, we can study uh, what happens, uh, let's say, in an organ or tissue uh, in, uh, let's say, uh, using uh, some uh, microfluidic system so that we can study how things are working, let's say, in the capillary uh, way, uh, capillary system, but then integrate the flow out of this capillary system into the circulatory, circulatory system and have it pumped all the way uh, to other organs in the body and see if, for example, our uh, bits are being received in that uh, in those other organs uh, at uh, distances of tens of centimeters or a meter uh, approximately. So this is the ultimate aim we're having, uh, we had in mind while uh, starting this work. At the moment, our short-term focus is on localization. So we will first be looking at localization. That means finding out where the transmitter is rather than at the moment, understanding whether the transmitting is transmitting a one or a zero. First, finding out where the transmitter is. Now, for the uh, we've been interested in localization uh, for a long time. We have published many papers on different uh, approaches in 
localization. So in the uh, circulatory, mock circulatory uh, network test bed, we are focusing on the mesoscale uh, localization problems. As I said, later we will be looking into more communication problems there. Uh, we, we are working on the mock circulatory network testbed. Meanwhile, we also have console simulations and uh, developing an analytical model. Uh, on the other uh, side, in macro scale, we'll be doing something else. That will be the second part of my talk. So for the moment, we're focused on the mesoscale and we're discussing the mock circulatory network testbed. So the test bed is composed of several components. So uh, we do have, we're making use of the Arduino uh, circuitry for the pH sensors. Uh, we also have Arduino circuitry for pressure sensors. Uh, we have printed an arterial model uh, of the same size of the human uh, heart and the uh, distribution uh, system. We do have serum uh, pumps that pump just like the heart, uh, the blood equivalent uh, fluids into this uh, circulatory network uh, and the uh, peristaltic pump. It's the peristaltic pump that's mostly working like the heart and the serum pump is typically injecting uh, the marker fluid into the circulatory system, for example, uh, for example, uh, mimicking, let's say, some uh, tumor cells. We do have the pH sensors and the pressure sensors in the system. So uh, all of these are in this uh, figure or photo uh, set you see in here. So. Uh, the system works as follows. There is the main pump that's taking the fluid from the inlet pump and pumping into the 3D printed arterial model. There's also the injection pump that is injecting the marker fluid into the main flow at some specific point, entering into the system uh, somewhere in this 3D printed arterial model. So we can change, of course, that point of injection. And there are uh, several sensors. Uh, these are pH sensors uh, that uh, measure the pH level at specific points. Uh, and uh, pressure sensors uh, that uh, measure the pressure. Uh, so we do have many sensors in the environment. Uh, we are keeping them in a a uh, very good orientation. So we're interested in uh, which side of the uh, system uh, things are being measured or not. Uh, so how it works, uh, from the parasitic pump, we pump the fluid uh, through a line directly into this uh, distribution point, which is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a 3D printed model. Uh, for the arteries. And from there, it's being, uh, according to pressure, it's uh, just getting distributed into uh, separate lines. So uh, e from each line, there is a, a flow into a specific uh, cup there. And in each cup, we have the corresponding sensors, either the pressure or the uh, uh, pH. Uh, sensors. Uh, note that each cup is directly connected to the central node here. And uh, what comes out of this uh, cup is just uh, discarded there. Uh, and the measurements from these sensors are uh, taken by these Arduino nodes and then passed on to a computer where we first do the recording and then do the processing. Uh, so why are we interested in uh, pH? Uh, the uh, pH uh, is, as you know, measuring the protons in the fluid, the concentration of the, it's based on the concentration of the protons in the fluid. 
the reason uh, is that the protons are typically the uh, markers for the infections in the body. This becomes, uh, this is of special interest to us, especially when we look at applications like uh, consider a patient who has some surgery that could be an implant to that patient's body or uh, just a regular sur uh, surgery. Uh, and then uh, after the operation, it is possible that some infection may occur in the body. Now, typically in today's world, the infection will cause some problems in the health of the patient and the patient will have the complaints, uh, especially after the patient leaves the hospital. The uh, patient will uh, resort back to the hospital uh, and the doctor will first detect, now talk to the uh, patient uh, and visually try to understand what the problem is and then uh, have some blood tests and then uh, from the blood test, try to identify uh, if there's infection or not. And then where the infection is, that's another issue. Uh, especially in the case of uh, the follow-up after uh, a surgery, uh, as I said, an infection is highly uh, likely to occur. So it could be in the future, it could be possible to place uh, some tiny uh, instruments in the body during the surgery for follow-up operations. We already, we're already working on such uh, equipment, so it's not something far in the future, uh, but it is possible and we're, uh, we are currently working on it. It is, for example, possible to place antennas that will dissolve in time, in a couple of months, inside the body. So you don't need to remove it later. And uh, you can have transmission uh, from the body without using any uh, transmit power. So without any battery power, it is possible to uh, take measurements from the body. Uh, so that's why we're firstly interested in uh, the pH level. Uh, it has some well-established chemical models for its behavior. We know how pH changes. Uh, it's highly accessible and easy to use. Uh, you can easily find equipments for uh, taking measurements on that, we did. And the choice of the marker particles does not affect the antenna array response significantly. So independent of what type of marker uh, particles you use, you can easily work with that. Uh, in our uh, preliminary tests, the sampling period of the uh, pH sensors is approximately 1.2 seconds. And the Arduino kit that gathers the data uh, first timestamps the data it receives uh, before sending it to the PC. So the timestamping is done at the Arduino uh, sensors uh, rather than the Arduino controller rather than the uh, PC itself. Uh, and the reason for that is that the earlier the timestamping is, the more correct it is because otherwise if you try to do it at the PC, we have seen that uh, there's some variable delay there. So it's just affecting the results and it's not correct in that case. So this is uh, how you collect the uh, pH data uh, in individual sensors. Now, when you have multiple sensors, each sensor has a unique ID. So we know which data comes from which sensor. And the ESO uh, circuit boards are connected to a central Arduino Uno. Uh, and uh, the data is then uh, collected at the Arduino uh, uh, processor and uh, communicated to the uh, PC uh, through uh, the I2C protocol, uh, and the aggregated data is then gathered from all sensors uh, uh, read from the Arduino you know, and uh, processed by the Pi serial uh, Python code. There, uh, the uh, for the pressure sensors in the individual sensors, the sampling period is now uh, 0.05 seconds, and the similarly the Arduino. Uh, kit first timestamps and sends it uh, through the uh, processor 
and uh, there they're all collected according and labeled according to the ID of the sensor and processed in the PC using again Pi serial. I'm going to show some uh, preliminary results. We are still working on this, but as I said, for the moment our focus is localization rather than detection uh, of the individual bits. But still, for the uh, transmission, you will see a one zero one zero. Uh, sequence isn't here. So the uh, symbol duration here is quite uh, long. It's 60 seconds. So for 60 seconds, uh, we do some transmission, then six, six seconds silence, and that's repeated. Uh, there, we're using only the right sensors I've shown in that photograph. Uh, so uh, if we look at the results, uh, we see that on the left sensors you don't have you don't see anything and the reason is as i said the injection point is after the split uh, in that uh, distribution center so we're injecting directly into the uh, line that's later further split into the three uh, sensors on the right but uh, since the flow is uh, unidirectional the sensors on the left don't see anything, and that's what we observe in the top uh, three rows, uh, the top three figures. So it's just for verification. And this is what we observe in the uh, other uh, three sensors on the right. As you can see, the outcome is different based on how close uh, that release point is. Uh, sorry, the, that uh, sampling point is. Uh, how close it is to the release point, to the injection point. And you can see that uh, there is a clear uh, peak for each uh, release. And you see the dips here for zero, but you also see that it's accumulative. Uh, that's also something that uh, needs uh, further attention. Now, that was with the first test bed. Now, the second test bed. As you can see from the name, it's macro scale, but still uh, we consider that to be molecular communications. The aim here is to be able to detect, for example, a leakage into, let's say, a pond or river, uh, where the leakage is from. Uh, this could later further be expanded to underwater communications over long distances. It could even be expanded to, for example, locating a crashed, uh, an airplane that crashed into, let's say, the ocean. If uh, the uh, plane, the black box, starts releasing some specific chemicals there. So we do have a, a water tank, as you see in here uh, below. And there is the water channel, which is eight meters long. Uh, and there's the filter and the pump, as we'll see in later figures. So this is uh, basically uh, the how the testbed system is working. So we have, as I said, an 80, uh, eight meters long uh, water channel. The width is 30 centimeters and the depth is 60 centimeters. And we release the water from here, including some uh, specific chemicals also, they can be released, uh, for example, from here. So you can release, you can move the emission point as you wish. And there's a laser beam that's getting a cross section into this water channel. And we're looking into how these uh, emitted molecules, messenger molecules that are emitted from this emission point how they diffuse in this flow uh, at some specific distance. Uh, these uh, emitted molecules are uh, highlighted by the laser beam, as you will see in the video soon. Uh, and this is showing the top view. This was the side view, and this is the top view of our channel. Uh, we started running some uh, experiments, uh, the uh, release point is, uh, we're trying different 
release points at different distances, like 40 centimeters, 50 centimeters, 60 and 7 centimeters. As you know, uh, for molecular communications, these are extremely long distances. In, uh, typically, when we're talking about in-body applications, we're looking at distances which are tens of micrometers. Now we're talking about tens of centimeters. And uh, here, for example, in the middle, you see what the channel was looking like before there was any release. And then you start having the release. You see that on the left. And then this is after some time has passed. So uh, here's the original uh, sample video. Uh, I'm going to, it's already open here. So uh, let me just open that video here. Now, this is a two minutes long video. I'm not going to uh, stay silent for two minutes. Uh, so I'm going to just a little bit take us further, around 25 seconds. Now you see the release coming in. These are the molecules that are highlighted by that laser beam. This is what we observe. And soon the release will end. And then we will again have an almost clear channel. Then we will have yet another release. And then again, uh, a clear channel. See, now the symbol has almost passed. And we again see a clear channel. I'm not going to play all of the video. As I said, it's just uh, what I've explained there. Uh, now, what you're doing in here is, uh, now this is what I, the video I showed you is the original. That was real experiment. Now doing the experiments, as you know, is quite uh, difficult and uh, time uh, consuming. So we are trying to benefit from uh, uh, machine learning to generate similar replicated uh, videos that are, of course, fake. We're just making it up uh, with artificial intelligence, but have the same behavior. We're currently working on that. So the second video I'm going to show you is work in progress. So uh, it's not uh, great, but uh, still, as I said, it's work in progress. We're working on this. What you're going to see here will not be a full uh, video, uh, sorry, the full transmission, but uh, just the release part. So this is just the bit one. Uh, this is not, as I said, uh, excellent, but uh, we're just working on this at the moment. So the, my time is up. Thank you.